So I want to go back to our definition here for a, a second, and I want to pull out two of the concepts that are embedded in it. First is this idea of doing trauma sensitivity on a school-wide basis. We need a theory of action for how to do that. And then we also need a theory of action about how to incorporate it into our educational mission of our schools. So this brilliant principle that we worked with told us that what we need is a framework, a framework to help educators weave trauma sensitivity into all of the daily operational functions of the school. And these were the six operations that she told us um, were the, the, the sort of the skeleton or the scaffold that makes the school, the structure. Leadership, professional development, access to resources and services, academic and non-academic strategies, policies and procedures, and collaboration with families. And what she taught us was that really no matter what you want to do on a school-wide basis, maybe it's not trauma sensitivity, it's some other initiative. If you want to do it in a whole school way, you can't do that without at least thinking through these six things and figuring out what role each one is going to play in implementation. The second thing, and this gets to the mission, is we learned over time that educators need a process to help them integrate trauma sensitivity into the educational mission of their school. Um, again, this is that, 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 that move from programs and bringing an intervention into your school to thinking about a process for changing fundamentally the way we do business, the way we are who we are in our school, um, the, the, the culture that we embody. And so we've come up with an inquiry-based process. So I like that Christy talked about the importance of inquiry and, and teaching that in your program because this is about asking questions and reflecting on the answers. Um, an inquiry-based process to address educators' concerns and design locally tailored solutions. And what we learned is at the policy level, you, know, you can't mandate um, the desire to become trauma-sensitive, much as we might like to. Um, but this is about you know, schools recognizing an urgency about the issue of trauma, deciding to take it on, and then figuring out what do we need to do in our building to make this work for us. And so this is the process that we've outlined in the second book. It starts with the question, why do we feel an urgency to become a trauma-sensitive school? And usually this starts with a small group of educators in the building, um, and what we advocate is eventually, you know, figuring out who the like-minded folks are and hopefully with the support of your school leader, um, starting maybe a steering committee, maybe doing some uh, PLCs, doing some, you know, text-based um, discussions um, as, a, as a group of faculty members. And then ultimately in step two, building up enough of a critical mass that you can take it to the whole faculty. And then the question for the school leader really is, how do we know we are ready? to create a trauma-sensitive action plan. Before we embark on this, you know, is my, is my faculty on board? And so this is where we might start with a, a whole staff professional development, a two-hour training for everybody to expose them to many of the ideas that we've heard in this conference today, but then figuring out, you know, is the staff ready to take those ideas and run with it? Or is it just not something that is, is uh, going to happen? If the school is ready, then the third question is what actions will both address priorities identified by the staff, and here, you know, the priorities that a staff might start out with are reducing punitive discipline, or, um, you know, in a lot of the more affluent um, communities that we're called into, it's because there's things like a spate of suicides that have happened because kids are so stressed out. And so they'll, that, that'll be the, the sort of horse that leads them to the water of trauma sensitivity. It can be very different in different communities, but the idea is that whatever the action plan is, um, can't just address trauma in the abstract, but has to address it in a way that that school is feeling urgent about it. And then finally, and this is the reflective piece, um, how do we know we are becoming a trauma-sensitive school? After we've set an action plan and we begin implementing, um, it's about instilling this spirit of inquiry um, and evaluative inquiry in, into a school um, so that we're constantly asking questions about what we can do better, is it working, um, and how do we know? What data are we looking at? So that's what goes on at the school level. Um, I want to, uh, I'm almost out of time, I think I am out of time, but the fifth and final idea, which maybe I can um, talk about very quickly, is at the policy level. And here we say that helping traumatized children learn should become a major focus of education reform. And so the question that we find ourselves as lawyers asking is, what role can law and policy play in setting the conditions that allow for a good holistic practice? Um, if you can't just mandate this, 
um, and we shouldn't be mandating this. Well, what can we do? Um, does law have a role to play? And I think we answered that question, of course, by saying yes, because um, not only are there things that, that law and policy can do to help make this work more possible, but sometimes it needs to get out of the way um, and let educators do what you've been trained to do and that you can do very well and, um, and, and stop um, you know, hanging more albatrosses around your necks with all these various mandates. So, so law certainly has an influence. And, and what are the conditions that will allow for a good holistic practice? So what I'll leave you with is just what our guiding principles have been um, as we've approached this with our state legislature. Um, the first is that school operations have to drive policy. Um, and we've heard, um, I think somebody mentioned, maybe Jonah it was you, like the 51 mandates or something, or all the balls that educators have to juggle um, that the legislatures seem to be constantly throwing at you. And um, you know, most of those things, like anti-bullying laws or um, you know, dropout prevention laws. I mean, these are all important things. It's not that we as a society shouldn't be tackling these issues. But what we would say is, is there a way that when we um, create laws to address these problems, those laws can at least reflect that framework, that six-part framework that I shared with you about school operations. So that, um, you know, at, at, at least schools can begin to see what are the efficiencies and the overlaps between all these mandates. You know, Bradley said, one of the things he said was that, you know, um, regardless of what traumatic experiences kids have had, you know, there's a core that's the same with all of these things. And I think I would apply that same logic to the many different initiatives that we're asking schools to do, whether it's social emotional learning or, as I said, you know, bullying prevention or truancy reduction was one in our state. Um, these all come back to the idea of having a core school culture and environment where kids feel engaged, safe, supported, welcomed. And if we can focus on the similarity there and the same structure that underlies all of those things, then all of a sudden it's not 51 different things, it's just 51 different shades of the same thing. Um, and if policymakers can take that approach, I think it will be easier. Um, again, this is sort of saying the same thing, aligning these multiple mandates and initiatives. Um, locally tailored solutions. I mean, we've just seen over and over again that one size fits all approaches just ultimately don't sync with the unique and very individualized cultures that exist in each and every one of our schools. Involving all the stakeholders, um, which takes a lot of time and it's really messy and can be really hard to do, but everybody's voice is so important. Um, starting with the choir. So we've taken the approach in our state of starting with grant programs and letting those schools that want to be the first horse out of the gate, you know, that want to be the first ones experimenting, that have the, the energy and the urgency to do this, um, let them do it first. Support them to experiment. And then what we've seen is the way things spread across the state much more effectively than a mandate is peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So when we would have a grant program and then have a conference where the grantees would present to other educators, that was how we saw the, the quickest ad uh, adoption of new practices across the state. Um, not by a top-down mandate. Um, and finally, multiple remedies. There's not gonna be just one law that gets passed that's gonna be the panacea that makes all of this happen. You, you pick off a piece at a time. A grant program here, um, you, know, um, you know, a little bit more funding there. Um, you know, revising our, our statewide school discipline law was a good opportunity to insert some of these um, principles and ideas. So as each new thing comes down the pipe, we try to insert um, a, a trauma-sensitive approach into it. Um, rather than thinking there's going to be one trauma-sensitive schools law that just fixes everything once and for all. So um, I will just, I know I'm way over and I'm going to end by saying that you can read more on our website about the law that we got passed in 2014 called the Safe and Supportive Schools Law. Um, and for those of you that want to know more about the specifics of that, I would be happy to, um, to tell you uh, more um, privately. Thank you. was a great way to end and uh, 
bringing things together and giving us guiding principles to move forward, that would hopefully give everyone something tangible to, move, to, to take with you back to, to uh, either schools or um, in the classrooms. Let's, um, while I'm getting things ready up here, let's take a question. Hi, um, do you, you guys think, um, this is for anyone, that trauma sensitive schools um, can be implemented in higher education? Um, should they, can they, how might they be different? Thank you. I cannot, I don't know what to do. Okay. I can only speak to you from the small experience I've had with Cheney University, where so many of the students who come, uh, come out of trauma. And uh, the way the university looked at its whole system and placed um, a knowledge of how trauma behaves, how it impedes learning, how it impedes social interaction, um, what it can look like in a student and uh, people became much more aware and then began to do the kind of personal mentoring and supports that are also beneficial to these kids as well as the institutional structures. I would agree with that. Is this working? Can you hear me? I would agree with that. Um, one thing that I've come to the realization about is that when you talk about trauma and children with trauma, and this was mentioned this morning in, in, this, in a couple of sessions, is what these um, experiences mean for those who are sitting there listening. So I um, currently have a student who has disclosed in the context of me recently talking about children who have experienced abuse, um, who has disclosed to me, to me after class that that had been her experience. And ironically, last night I received an email from her telling me that she's really struggling academically because she's dealing with a lot. So I do think we need to be prepared um, to respond to our students in higher education when in fact something we raise, something we expose them to, something they're exposed to in the context of their higher education experiences is unearthed and they're struggling. We happen to have a really wonderful counseling program on our campus. We have a great relationship to them. Um, we can just pick up the phone and call and get someone in there immediately, so we're very fortunate in that regard. But I do think it sort of goes back to what Carlo and Brian were talking about. Um, this morning is that if you're going to do an inventory and you're going to discover things, you have to be prepared in terms of how you're going to respond to your own students' needs, be them four or be them 24. Um, I think as on many campuses, you know, over the past two years, um, the students on our campus have been um, have been forcing us to look at the culture of our institution. Um, with everything that's going on, I mean, beginning with Ferguson, but continuing, you know, right up through what, whatever the latest, you know, incident has been. It seems like there's been something every week. Um, you know, our students have been very um, articulate about telling us the ways in which the culture of our institution has not been responsive um, and, and not teaching them the tools that they need to confront the injustices that they're seeing um, out there in society. And, and certainly trauma it plays a role in that. So I think I've been very grateful for the student activism on our campus. And um, so do we need to create trauma-sensitive learning environments in higher education? I would say absolutely yes. And I would say that you know, some of the considerations are different than in you know, the K-12 domain. Um, but the core principles are the same, and our students are demanding it. So, again, good for them for, for doing so. So we have a, a question here, um, and this is for anyone on the panel. When we want to directly influence policy or inform legislators, where do we start? Who do we contact? That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Call the office. Get an appointment. You may, it may be that you speak with a staffer. That's okay. Their job is to tell the elected official what you came in and said. It is a good thing to take research with you if you are advocating for change in policy because they don't know. 
If, if you look, and I'll just talk to Pennsylvanians, I don't know how many states are in here, but just go on the state website and look at the backgrounds of the people who make policy and pass laws in Pennsylvania, and you will see, by and large, they don't know about the thing that you know needs to happen. And so they do depend on you to educate them. Join coalitions who are like-minded and go as a group. Send them research. This is what we did to get um, trauma recognized in the basic education funding formula. We, we met with Senator Deniman. We talked about it. He became a champion of it. We went to other legislators. We sent lots and lots and lots of research. We testified. And that's how it's done. You teach. You teach them. They get it. And they will work with you on it. <laughs> If I may ask a follow-up question to that, I know yesterday David gave us one idea, which is to f structure your, your question or your, your information to share with policy members in terms of economics. Are there other um, suggestions that you might have in terms of how we might present the research? I, I'm assuming policymakers wouldn't want to read several pages of, of documents. They have staff. They have staff. You are paying staff. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have an education staffer. If they're on the uh, education committee in the House or Senate, they've got a person there that just works on education. And, and that staffer reads the stuff. Uh, they have a research body in the uh, state assembly. So if, if your legislator um, catches on to the idea their staff goes to the research body and says, dig up everything you can on this. And they have systems in place in your state assembly that you are paying for. And one of the things I learned, because I'm a school teacher, I learned that I had never informed myself as to how the government was organized to work for me. They've got lots, they've got thousands of people on your payroll. And they will go do a lot of the footwork. You just need to get the legislator to buy into the need. Can I add just a few things? I absolutely sure. agree with everything that you just said. And I would add a, a couple of things. One is um, what the legislators care most about is how whatever the issue you're going to speak to them about affects their constituents, yeah. the people who are going to vote for them. So it's good to bring the research, mm -hmm. and you should have good research if it exists, but then what you should be able to do is tell them how that research affects their communities, you know, and the students and the educators mm -hmm. um, in their towns. And so don't be afraid to tell a story. Um, it doesn't all have to be about statistics. Yeah. Um, you know, they like to see s statistics when you have them, but if you can tell a very compelling story, a personal narrative about how the issue has impacted somebody in their district, um, that's going to get you far as well. True, true, yeah. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. I don't know if this is a question. Um, there probably is a question somewhere in there. So the thing that keeps coming up for me, the discussions this morning, the amazing presentations this afternoon, and then even the last two questions posed is this idea of universal precaution. And as it pertains to trauma responsive, trauma sensitive, trauma informed care education. And for us to remember, and then it's maybe even a selling point when we are going to our superintendent or our legislators, that you know germ theory was once as obscure as trauma theory. And now, even yesterday, we were using some medical models uh, to describe what trauma-informed care re really could be about which is this understanding that you should always act as if. So just like now, you have hand sanitizer everywhere, and every teacher and every nurse and every everybody learns to wear gloves when you do whatever it is you have to do with your kids. Um, do we know if everybody has a fluid-borne disease? No, but you act as if, 
right? So this idea of trauma-informed care kind of being about universal precautions, not again, not only for children, but as our panelists described, for our staff, for our families, because it really does need to be the entire school community. Um, so I just didn't know if you, any of you have had some conversations or experience around that language, and if it's been helpful, if people buy into it a little bit more. Absolutely. So if you go on our website, the traumasensitiveschools.org, um, there used to be on, on the homepage a video that you can click on and watch. And um, it's Mary Beth Curtis, who was the former director for the Center for Special Education at Lesley University, um, which is a major teacher training institution in our community. And she talks about the concept of universal design, which is very similar to universal precaution. But she gives a couple of great examples. And I have shared these examples with policymakers. And I think they're very good. Um, so see what you think. So one of them is the example of curb cuts. Um, so you know, we put curb cuts in the sidewalks for folks um, in wheelchairs. But who among us has not used the curb cuts? I'm about to leave with my roller suitcase to go back to the airport, and I guarantee you I will use those curb cuts to roll my suitcase up on the sidewalk. Um, so it's an intervention that was done for a specific subpopulation, but all of us have found ways to benefit from that. And then the other example she uses is closed captioning you know, television. That was for you know, folks with hearing impairments, but you know, when you're in the gym on the you know, Stairmaster or whatever, and you know, you're able to see what's on the TV because you can read the closed captioning or in the bar or what have you. So it's something, again, that we all benefit from. So I think using some concrete examples like that and universal precautions that would be another one are things that can make this concept of this is really for all kids. Mm. Whether or not um, any of us has traumatic experiences, we're all gonna have a bad day where we're dysregulated and we need that extra TLC and so all of us are gonna you know, learn more that day because we were in an environment that was safe and supportive. And to follow up, Mike, if you could speak towards that universal precaution in terms of what TLPI did, which is to, you know, we had this discussion about it, at, at the end of it all, it really is how do we create safe and supportive environments for children. So we, um, maybe an, another um, way of making it sound more universal is, you know, when we went to go get a law passed, we didn't, as I said, call it the trauma-sensitive mm -hmm. schools law. We, we used language that is broader, you know, safe and supportive schools. Mm -hmm. And one of the superintendents that we worked with many years ago who was working with us to create a trauma-sensitive school and actually had the buy-in of his school committee, which is what we call school boards in Massachusetts, was so proud of the work that he was doing. And somehow the local television station got wind of it and they said, we want to come and interview you and see what you're doing in your school. And he told them all about trauma-sensitive schools. Well, there was uproar from the parents who said, I don't want my kid going to a trauma school. What, you know, I don't want traumatized kids in my kid's school. Like, why, what's going on you know, in our school? So you've got to be careful about what you call it, you know, because there's, maybe this is the packaging, I don't know, that Susan was talking about, but it's how we market things, how we communicate you know, to the community. Um, and so safe and supportive schools is just a, a somewhat more neutral way to talk about, um, and a more universal way to talk about this work, but um, in the law that we ended up getting passed, it defines a safe and supportive school to include all of the different advocacy initiatives that have been you know, going on recently. So it includes bullying prevention, mm -hmm. social emotional learning, inclusive education for students with disabilities, foster care, homeless education, and trauma sensitivity. So it's in the law, it's on the list, but trauma sensitivity, but it's one of many things that a school might you know, focus on as the leverage point for creating this kind of school culture and environment. Thank you. Do we have anyone else from the audience before I read, read off Slido? Uh, Jen? This is for Dr. Terrell Corbett, a little, bit about, um, a little bit about changing policy and impacting policy to, at the Department of Ed for training teachers mm -hmm. and in services. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that work? At this, the State Department of Education or the U.S. Department of Education? Whatever you choose. Okay. Um, I, as I mentioned to you, when we developed our new dual certification program, um, I'm particularly proud of the fact that we really engaged the stakeholders from the beginning. And um, we thought hard about the schools that we were working with. We have this commitment, as I also mentioned to you, to work in Title I school communities. As a result of that work that we did in designing this dual certification program, 
Um, our program has now been developed as, uh, been identified as the model program for the state of Maryland. Um, the former state superintendent of Maryland, Nancy Grasmick, who was the um, longest state superintendent um, to serve in the history of the United States of America, the first superintendent, uh, 